All right, welcome to MCAT Metabolism Part 2. Um, I'm Charlie. I delivered this lecture for MCAT Bros yesterday. Um, and today we're going to be going through the same lecture covering. Last week we did digestive enzymes glycolysis pyruvate dehydrogenase complex in the citric acid cycle. Uh, so that video is already live on YouTube. Well, if you're watching this on YouTube, it's this video is live as well. And then today, what we're going to be going through is gluconeogenesis, fermentation in the Cori cycle, glycolysis, glycogenesis, and glycogenolysis. And then the handout's going to have pentose phosphate pathway, but we didn't get to that yesterday when I gave this lecture. And I want to keep things in sync. So we're just going to be going through these three for today. And then upcoming um, in future lectures are going to include electron transfer chain, beta oxidation, fatty acid synthesis, ketone bodies, uh, glucogenic and ketogenic amino acids, as well as the urea cycle. So um, intro to metabolism for anybody who's watching this video for the first time or hasn't been to the session previous to this one. Um, MCAT metabolism is one of the most difficult topics for, uh, for students to master. Um, and I, I love to talk about metabolism because it connects so many of these lower level um, topics, more fundamental topics, connects a lot of these things together. Um, so we're talking about, you know, reducing sugars, we're talking about, you know, protein structure, we're talking about OCHEM reactions, reduction oxidation, enzyme classes, bioenergetics, um, cell structure and digestion, and, and probably other things as well. Uh, so a thorough understanding of metabolism will help you reinforce and connect all these little, you know, sort of smaller topics. And so that's the purpose of going through metabolism in such detail uh, together. Tips for metabolism. Um, one thing to keep in mind is if you connect your enzyme names with your substrate names and your bond changes, that's only gonna help you to uh, learn this metabolism um, and have it stick better and longer. So this is a great way to guide yourself through metabolism using the enzyme names, the substrate names, and the bond changes. And we did a lot of that last week. We'll do a lot of that this week as well. Look for patterns. There are patterns all over metabolism. Metabolism's oxidative. So it makes sense that there are going to be some similar you know, oxidation reactions, be some similar hydrolysis reactions, um, decarboxylation reactions, electron carriers being reduced. And uh, be like a child. Ask, why is this happening often? Ask yourself why, 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 as a child does until you get to the very fundamental ground concepts. And I like to say that a narrative understanding of metabolism is superior to brute force memorization. So what do I mean by that? For instance, in glycolysis, people like to say not every step is high yield. And this may be true. We may not be asked a lot about the, uh, the phosphoglyceromutase. Um, we may not be asked a lot about that step. However, if we incorporate every single intermediate and every single enzyme go through from A to Z, we have a, achieved a narrative understanding where we can follow everything from the beginning to the end rather than memorizing metabolism as a series of discrete reactions. Because what happens when we memorize a series of discrete things, as opposed to having a general framework that links them all together, is we tend to not understand what's going on in the big picture, and we tend to not be able to remember them better or, as, or, or for as long. Uh, and then just, just, just like, just as life advice, like get yourself a whiteboard or some, some way of like, you can go through pencil and paper and go through a million papers. Uh, I think a whiteboard is superior because it allows you, for instance, to maybe write all of the series of reactions of glycolysis, then erasing all, for instance, the enzyme names. So you're just looking intermediates. You have to remember what was the enzyme name that did this reaction? and fill them back in and then erase all of the intermediates and you just have the enzyme names and then fill those back in. You can do this for a lot of your metabolic path pathways. You can do this for amino acids as well. Sort of the one letter, three letter uh, side chain, any special properties for amino acids. So maybe you erase all of the one letter and you leave all the other information. Can you remember all the one letter abbreviations? You erase all the three letter abbreviations. Can you connect the name of the molecule to the the one letter abbreviation, remember the, th the three letter abbreviation. So this, is, this has been really helpful to me um, and <laughs> some of my students have been getting whiteboards and following this. And it's not only for um, the, the MCAT, but it also a lot of my med student friends have whiteboards or, or have access to whiteboards, you know, if you have study rooms and stuff like that. Um, so this will serve you well for the MCAT as well as med school. 
So um, we left off with citric acid cycle last time. And so now we're gonna start talking about gluconeogenesis. So gluconeogenesis we know is the production of glucose from precursor molecules, such as pyruvate and lactate, but not limited to, can also use oxaloacetate and citric acid cycle intermediates. When do we do gluconeogenesis? Question for you. What, uh, under what conditions in the body would we want to do gluconeogenesis? Um, would this be when there's a reversal of glycolysis? Reverse of glycolysis, yeah. Um, so we're producing glucose, which means, right, so in the chat I see low glucose fasting, correct. If we have low blood glucose, for instance, such as when we're fasting and we haven't had a meal in a while, what could be another condition that would lead to low glucose? A lack of oxygen, that would be more for fermentation, uh, for anaerobic glycolysis. What could be another condition where we have, yeah, where we, we don't have enough or we need to get more blood sugar. We need to get more sugar into the blood to deliver to other tissues. What could be a condition? About when you're, what's a, what's a part of the body that uses a lot of energy? You're moving around muscles, good. So muscles, so during exercise could be another type of, or another set of conditions when we would want to do gluconeogenesis. And we'll get back to gluconeogenesis when it comes to muscles, or when it comes to feeding muscles, when we talk about the Cori cycle. And the brain also? Uh, the brain, yeah. So the brain also needs glucose. So if we had a lack of blood glucose from either fasting, pr pretty much fasting, maybe not so much exercise, uh, then we would probably want to do gluconeogenesis until we ran out of gluconeogenic precursors, at which point we would switch to what that we haven't talked about yet. What would we switch to when we run out of gluconeogenic precursors to still maintain the uh, feeding the brain? Um, cat, cat, ketone bodies. Perfect. Yeah, ketone bodies. Yep, exactly. And we'll come to that. Uh, we'll come back to that in probably like two lectures from now. And then um, glucogenic amino acids, which we're gonna cover in a later lecture as well, can also serve as precursor molecules for gluconeogenesis. What are the main um, organs that do gluconeogenesis? The big one is the liver, um, but it also takes place in the kidney. Gonna be more important, uh, more important in the liver, but really focus on the liver when it comes to gluconeogenesis, or especially when it comes to the Cori cycle. The kidney, I wasn't, I'm not really clear as to why gluconeogenesis also occurs in the kidney. And we were talking about this yesterday in the MCAP Rose lecture. Um, also, if anybody knows, happens, does happen to know, please feel free to drop the information for us. I have that question myself because I'm like kidney. I was surprised when I saw that, so. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's like, okay, well, liver makes sense. Liver is the place where we like to store a lot of um, energetic precursors. It's the, like to say that the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell, but the liver is the powerhouse of the body when it comes to energy. One thing that I was thinking about is, when we have lactate in the blood, so normally the lactate, and we'll come to this in the quarry cycle, would go to the liver for the liver to do nucleogenesis on it so it could produce glucose and then put the glucose into the blood. We could also have lacto lactate in the blood that gets filtered in the kidney. And perhaps we would actually want to save that lactate because we can still squeeze some more energy out of it. And so maybe the kidney is doing gluconeogenesis on lactate, making glucose out of it, so it can send glucose back into the bloodstream. So that was, that was kind of the hypothesis we came up with in uh, the MCAP Rose lecture yesterday, but I'm not 100% sure as to why it also goes in kidney. We talked about these. Um, what hormones would stimulate gluconeogenesis? Okay, glucagon, good. What else? other hormones that promote higher blood glucose. Mm. Mm. Glucagon mm. and insulin kind of want to do opposite things. Insulin wants to lower blood glucose, right? Acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA will be a, a player in this, but it's not an actual hormone. So, uh, one would be another scenario. So glucagon, right? When we're, uh, when we're fasting, we produce glucagon um, from our pancreatic alpha cells to raise blood glucose. 
so we can feed all the tissues with glucose. So glucagon is one example. What would be another condition? We talked about exercise, right? So what hormone would you associate with exercise? Or maybe like survival, running from a swarm of bees or a bear. What kicks in? Adrenaline. Adrenaline, yeah, epinephrine, norepinephrine. So epinephrine is gonna be another hormone that stimulates uh, gluconeogenesis. And then there's one more uh, that, raises, that raises blood glucose, one more hormone. This one's a steroid. Do we know it? Cortisol, excellent, yeah. Um, so glucagon, epinephrine, and cortisol are all gonna stimulate gluconeogenesis. And the other thing about gluconeogenesis, it follows most of the same steps of glycolysis, but in reverse. However, as we're gonna see, um, we're focused mainly on the re irreversible steps of glycolysis that have separate enzymes that perform the reverse reaction for gluconeogenesis. We're gonna be focusing on the steps that are different. We talk about gluconeogenesis since we already covered glycolysis. So here's our overview of glycolysis and gluconeogenesis right next to each other. We can see our familiar glycolysis reactions all the way from glucose down to pyruvate. Of course, we make two pyruvate per glucose. Then you can see some of the steps here are opposite or are not opposite, but different, right? So pyruvate kinase has actually two enzymes that do the work of performing the reverse reaction. You see, some of these are the same. Eolase is the same, phosphoglycerate mutase, kinase. These guys are the same, these guys are the same, these guys are the same. And we get to the First and the third steps of gluconeogenesis are gonna have different enzymes performing those steps. And we'll talk about why we need different enzymes for some of these steps. Most reactions in glycolysis are reversible for gluconeogenesis. However, steps one, three, and 10 of glycolysis are too exergonic. And so they have different, different enzymes that uh, as we'll talk about, will perform the same reaction, but slightly differently. Um, and thus, those, re those reactions are going to actually require different enzymes. Now, what, uh, so if a step is exergonic, the reverse step would be what? What, could, what word could we use for the reverse step? Endogenic? Yeah, we could say, we could say endergonic. Yeah, exactly. Um, however, so we, we could associate that with a positive delta G. However, can an enzyme cause an irreversible reaction or a endergonic reaction? Can an enzyme cause an endergonic reaction to become exergonic? Can we make an enzyme, a delta G that's positive into negative by using an enzyme? No, right? Enzymes don't change thermodynamics. They just change kinetics. So as we'll talk about, there are, there are, some, there are some reasons why we're able to turn these highly exergonic steps in the forward direction that would be highly endergonic in the reverse direction there will be ways that our enzymes will allow us to sort of circumvent that problem of them not being able to catalyze a endergonic reaction. Also remember that starting with aldolase in the forward reactions of glycolysis, we make one six carbon molecule into two three carbon molecules. So likewise in the reverse in gluconeogenesis, we'll start with two pyruvate per glucose that we want to make, which will stay two, 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 all the way until we do aldolase again, and we join the three carbon molecules into a six carbon. Questions here before we move on. Uh, yeah, can you go over one more time with the exergenic and endogenic process and how um, enzymes don't, um, you know, cause an endogenic reaction to occur? Sure. So, when we say, when we see a reaction that has a delta G, which is negative, what can we say about that reaction? What are some terms we could use to describe that? Delta G is negative. We could say the reaction is spontaneous. Another thing we could say is it's favorable. When delta G of a forward reaction is negative, but we wanna do the reverse reaction, delta G becomes positive. The reaction is non-spontaneous. Now, we go back, if, if we go back to, which we, we won't go back to it today, but if you go back to uh, recording one from MCAT Metazlin part one, we went off, we went off, we really did go off on an entire like sort of breakdown of delta G standard versus delta G non-standard. So delta G not versus simply delta G. And we talked about how a delta G not that's positive 
can have a delta G that's negative, should we feed that reaction enough reactants? We drive the reaction forward despite the delta G not being positive. There are ways to overcome this problem to an extent, but if you have a really, really exergonic forward reaction, then it's really hard to reverse that reaction even by reactant loading the reaction. And so what we'll talk about today is how some of these enzymes solve that problem of having a forward reaction that's too exergonic and therefore a reverse reaction that's too endergonic, too positive delta G. Does that kind of answer your question? Yes, thank you. Perfect. So first step of gluconeogenesis will be performed by pyruvate carboxylase. This is step 10 of glycolysis. We're gonna use the glycolytic numbers. What does this enzyme name sound like it's doing to the substrate? I think it removes carbon from pyruvate, making it a, f yeah, it removes carbon from pyruvate. So is it a carboxylase or is it decarboxylase? So would it's it be adding or taking away? Taking away. So we would usually call that like a decarboxylase. So in the forward or in the, in the gluconeogenic direction here, remember what, uh, how many carbons does pyruvate versus acceloacetate have? Pyruvate has three and then good, uh, acceloacetate has four, excellent. So in this case, we are actually adding a carbon. So here's our reaction for pyruvate carboxylase. So PC, here's our enzyme. Biotin is gonna be a coenzyme for pyruvate carboxylase. Not sure that you need to know, biotin is a, is a coenzyme for it. And as we can see, uh, we're actually adding CO2 in the form of bicarbonate. Uh, why might that be? Why don't we just simply add a carbon dioxide molecule? Or why would uh, bicarbonate be a better option? Think about states of matter. The state of matter of CO2 would be. It's all the good gas, aqueous, super, super critical fluid. CO2 would be gas, good. So is how easy is it to like grab a gas molecule and, and give, force it to accept, like become part of another molecule? Does it sound like it's easier or harder than maybe bicarbonate? Is this it doesn't sound like an easy thing to do, yeah. Um, whereas bicarbonate being water soluble would probably be an easier way to perform that same reaction. So we'll add a bicarbonate to pyruvate. You may see a lot of versions of this reaction where they just include the CO2, but just to make things make a little more sense as to what's happening sort of on the like on the ground level here. You may see some that are adding CO2, but we'll, we'll, talk, we'll, we'll show it as HCO3 minus. And what kind of reaction is this performing? So it looks like we have a carbonyl group or a carboxylic acid group. And this part of the molecule stays the same from pyruvate to acceloacetate. This part of the molecule stays the same. We're adding a carbon to an alpha carbon. So we have a carbonyl, we have an alpha carbon, this methyl. Anybody remember what reaction that might be? Substitution, elimination, addition, redox. SN1. We don't have a we don't have a good leaving group necessarily. And yeah, nothing nothing's really leaving here. Addition. Mm -hmm. So this is a type of addition. Does anybody remember when we add using an alpha carbon? What reaction that is? It's, it's a lot of people's least favorite MCAT reaction. What's your, what's your least favorite MCAT reaction, Any, anybody? You really, really dread like learning the mechanism of? Aldol, maybe? Anybody, anybody, any big fans of the Aldol reaction? We all kind of hate the Aldol reaction a little bit. <laughs> yeah, it's the Aldol. So this is an Aldol reaction, Aldol condensation. Yeah, 
Um, so we have carbox. So we have carboxylation here is the addition of a CO2, uh, which is in the form of bicarbonate, becoming a carboxylic acid. So we we now have a dicarboxylic acid with a alpha keto group. So we have oxaloacetate. We talked about this. So this uh, this reaction actually takes place in the mitochondrial matrix. We know that pyruvate gets translocated into the mitochondrial matrix for pyruvate dehydrogenase and the subsequent citric acid cycle reactions to take place. So when we want to do gluconeogenesis, we'll actually start in the mitochondria where our pyruvate ended up uh, prior to PDH and citric acid cycle. Uh, what class of enzyme is this? Is it a isomerase, transferase, hydrolase, oxidoreductase, ligase, or lyase? The six classes. Ligase, excellent, good. Yeah, this one's a ligase. It's using ATP hydrolysis to add uh, to join molecules together. Awesome. Questions on pyruvate carboxylase. All right, moving on. So a little more on, actually not moving on quite just yet, a little more on pyruvate carboxylase here. Oh, you know what? This was the same slide. This happened yesterday. Anyways, a little bit more on where this all is taking place. We said pyruvate gets translocated after glycolysis to the mitochondria, where one path it could take would be pyruvate dehydrogenase complex to make acetyl-CoA, which will then join oxaloacetate in the citric acid cycle. If we take a different path, take a different uh, road here with pyruvate carboxylase, we can turn pyruvate directly into oxaloacetate. And we saw it was using ATP and car here's, they're, they're showing carbon dioxide here. However, uh, once we want to continue back up the gluconeogenesis sort of um, ladder, we have to actually get oxaloacetate out of the mitochondria and then convert it into phosphoenol pyruvate, which is what we see PEP here. The problem is oxaloacetate doesn't actually have a mitochondrial transporter. And again, this is, this is something I don't know if you actually need to know for the MCAT, but oxaloacetate doesn't have a mitochondrial uh, transporter. So it actually gets converted into malate. That'd be an oxidation or reduction reaction there. Oxaloacetate to malate, the oxidation or reduction. The reduction, yeah. Normally, malate goes to oxaloacetate, which is oxidation. That would happen in the citric acid cycle. Here, we're actually reducing oxaloacetate into malate. Malate goes through um, the malate, it's called the aspartate malate shuttle. Oh, yeah. And then what's the name of the enzyme that performs this step here? Name of the enzyme that can convert between malate and oxaloacetate is? You said that's a redox reaction, so it probably is a type of dehydrogenase. Which, which one? Malate dehydrogenase, excellent. So malate dehydrogenase turns out as a reversible, catalyzes a reversible reaction where we can turn oxaloacetate to malate. Malate has a shuttle, then malate goes out of the mitochondria into the cytosol and can then be oxidized again back to oxaloacetate. And there's no net loss of, the, of NADH in the cell. And again, probably don't need to know about this shuttle, but I like to ask questions about like, how does such, and you know, we know one of these things happens in the mitochondria. We know other steps of gluconeogenesis happen in the cytosol. So how do we get from mitochondria to cytosol? And that's, this answers that question. Questions before we move on here. <clears throat> Somebody asked me a week or two ago, why is oxaloacetate a gluconeogenic intermediate? As in, why don't we just figure out a different way to get pyruvate back into phosphoenol pyruvate, PEP? And I came up with like sort of three different answers here. 
Uh, one answer, the, obvi the obvious answer is that because PEP to pyruvate is actually the most exergonic step, the most irreversible step in glycolysis, it would make sense to figure out a different way to get back to phosphoenyl pyruvate than trying to reverse a negative 7.5 delta G reaction, which is gonna be positive 7.5 in the opposite direction. So one answer would be, it's just easier to do it a different way than to try to reverse such an exergonic step. Another answer is that the pyruvate uh, dehydrogenase complex reaction, which is pyruvate to acetyl-CoA, is actually irreversible. I'm gonna show all of these bullet points because I, I wanna actually reference this. So this pyruvate to acetyl-CoA reaction is irreversible. In other words, we can't change acetyl-CoA back to pyruvate, but we can change pyruvate into a oxaloacetate so that we can actually, pyruvate can serve as sort of like the precursor to both acetyl-CoA and oxaloacetate, which are the two molecules that combine to kick off the citric acid cycle. That's, that's kind of cool. Pyruvate can kind of catalyze, or not catalyze, but pyruvate can kind of fuel the citric acid cycle without having additional precursors in the, or intermediates in the citric acid cycle. In other words, having oxaloacetate as a gluconeogenic intermediate allows the citric acid cycle intermediate pool to be used to make glucose. In other words, because we can't make oxaloacetate go back up the pathway and get to glucose, we can put, instead put acetyl-CoA into the citric acid cycle, or, or we can use any citric acid cycle intermediates that are existing in the cell, and we can then use them by making them into oxaloacetate and thus get back to glucose. So it gives us, in other words, more options of molecules as gluconeogenic precursors. Does that make sense? Any questions on that? So in other words, it's a, it's a, it's a matter of convenience. It's convenient um, or, or resourceful to be able to use any citric acid cycle intermediate to make glucose. Then additionally, uh, we'll talk about glucogenic, glucogenic amino acids in a future lecture. However, we'll look at it right now just for a, just to tie everything together. We have glucogenic amino acids, which are amino acids that can be transaminated and further, uh, further modified to become either pyruvate. So these glucogenic amino acids, and we have some that can be both. These guys will all be able to become pyruvate. And then we have others which can become gluconeogenic, sorry, yeah, uh, that can become citric acid cycle intermediates. So it's another matter of resourcefulness that we can use all these different amino acids that we can get in our diet, or in extreme cases during starvation, you might actually have muscle breakdown and break muscle down into amino acids, which we can then use to make more glucose. Those are some reasons why it, it either makes sense or it's extremely resourceful from the cellular standpoint to have acceloacetate as a glucogenic, gluconeogenic intermediate. Any questions here? Anything I can clarify? Next, uh, I have a sort of a question for you. So to prompt this question, pyruvate carboxylase, this is our enzyme that converts pyruvate into oxaloacetate. Pyruvate carboxylase is stimulated by acetyl-CoA. Question is why? Why would it make sense for pyruvate carboxylase to be stimulated by acetyl-CoA? because we know that pyruvate becomes acetyl-CoA or becomes oxaloacetate. So why would the enzyme that converts pyruvate to oxaloacetate be stimulated by the other thing pyruvate can become? 
Did I get everybody on that one? More acetyl-CoA means lower levels of pyruvate. Okay, I like where we're going. If we have an excess of acetyl-CoA, then what are we probably not able, like what, what could be the problem when we have an excess of acetyl-CoA? We don't have enough what? So what happens to acetyl-CoA combines with acetate to make citrate. If we don't, if we have too much acetyl-CoA, that might indicate that our citric acid cycle intermediate pool is what? We're, we're slowing down. We have too much acetyl-CoA. It might indicate our citric acid cycle pool is actually depleted. So excess acetyl-CoA would indicate that there's a, there's a blockage in our metabolic pipes. We have a blockage, which is probably indicative that we don't have enough oxaloacetate to combine the acetyl-CoA with to go into the citric acid cycle. And the reason why our citric acid cycle might be depleted is that citric acid cycle intermediates, including oxaloacetate, are used as a lot of biosynthetic precursors. For instance, we just talked about one, which is gluconeogenesis. But there's a whole lot of other uh, sort of linkages we can make, branch points from the citric acid cycle. We can make, for instance, we can actually make some of these, these uh, we can make some of these amino acids using citric acid cycle intermediates. So we call them non-essential amino acids. And this kind of explains why we would say that they're non-essential, right? Because if we can use citric acid cycle intermediates to make them, then it's not essential that we get them in our way. What is the whole like essential versus not essential? Essential amino acids are amino acids that we need to get in our, in our diet, good. Whereas not essential amino acids are amino acids we can make from other molecules. Sometimes non-essential amino acids are not essential because we can make them from essential amino acids. We can produce them from essential amino acids. In other cases, it's because we're actually making them from other precursors such as citric acid cycle intermediates. So that could be one sort of reason why the pool of citric acid cycle intermediates is depleted because maybe we're using them to make non-essential amino acids or maybe we're using them to make glu uh, glucose. There are other, other molecules like heme um, and purines and pyrimidines which are made from or can be made from citric acid cycle intermediates. This goes back to the whole idea that Pyruvate can do both, get you, get you someone who can do both. Pyruvate can become oxaloacetate and acetyl-CoA. So then pyruvate can replenish the citric acid cycle and keep it turning. Does that make sense? Any questions? So sort of to summarize, this enzyme pyruvate carboxylase is not just for gluconeogenesis. We're, we're introducing it in the context of gluconeogenesis, but we can see that it could also be used for things like replenishing citric acid cycle pool. And then step 10B. So now we've made pyruvate into oxaloacetate. We've moved oxaloacetate through the malate shuttle into the cytosol. And now we'll do PEP carboxykinase. I'm breaking down that name, what is what does a PEP carboxykinase enzyme seem to do? The kinase part tells us it's doing what? Adding phosphate. Adding phosphate, yeah. What's the difference between kinase and phosphorylase again? Kinases add phosphate from I think from one molecule to another. Yeah, specifically from a nucleotide triphosphate, typically from ATP. Whereas phosphorylases will just, they'll just give you a phosphate they found on the side of the road, be like here. Uh, whereas kinases will be like, I have this very special um, phosphate that I'm, I'm giving to you. It's, it's a high energy phosphate. So it's gonna help you catalyze an irreversible reaction. So the difference between kinases and phosphorylases. We can see the we can see the kinase part. We're adding a phosphate actually from GTP in this case, as opposed to ATP. 
Now, GTP, and we'll see actually uh, when we get to glycogenesis, u uracine, uh, uracil, sorry, uridine triphosphate, UD, UTP, we can use, in some case, in certain cases, we can use other nucleotide triphosphates than ATP to catalyze biological reactions. And in this case, we're doing GTP. And then the carboxy part, so kinases are adding a phosphate. We can see that we're adding a phosphate here. Remember with um, PEP, with pyruvate carboxylase, the carboxy indicated we were adding a phosphate, sorry, adding a, adding a carboxylic acid, but we're actually losing a carboxylic acid here. So this is like one of those weird enzymes where they, they seem to have named it for, uh, for the, both the forward and reverse reaction at the same time. What class of enzyme would this be? Okay, this is a tough one. It's actually a lyase where we're performing a retroaldol and eliminating CO2. We know lyases are enzymes that uh, join or break molecules using processes other than hydrolysis. I don't want to necessarily spend too much time on why this is a lyase, uh, and it's not necessarily something you should have to memorize because I don't. This is not a really obvious lyase example. We had some more obvious ones like aldolase, enolase, and fumarase. And some more obvious ones from last week, but it is it is sort of an example where, like, as as humans, we like to categorize things. We like to put in these little neat, nice, tidy categories. But like, does the body care whether this is a lyase or a ligase? No, right? The body don't care. Uh, the, the body's like, hey, if it gets the job done, we evolved this for a specific reason. We don't care, body doesn't care if it's a ligase or a lyase. So uh, this, is real, this, is, this is kind of an example of us trying to impose order onto chaos. Okay, yeah, so the, the, the kinase part is like for the forward reaction, but the carboxylase seems to be for, the carboxy part seems to be for the reverse reaction. And we did use GTP hydrolysis for an energy source. So, so far, remember in pyruvate carboxylase, we used ATP. And remember that we are, for per molecule of glucose, we're doing everything twice at this part of glycolysis. So, so far we used in the pyruvate carboxylase step, two ATP. Here we're using two GTP. So far, we've used four nucleotide triphosphates in gluconeogenesis, which is technically more than the net ATP we get from glycolysis in the first place. It turns out it's going to require more energy to do glycolysis than to do. It's going to require more energy to do gluconeogenesis than it required to uh, the, or that we harvested from glycolysis in the forward direction. So this is a more energetically costly process. And this step does occur in the cytosol. Any questions on PEP carboxykinase? Is this reversible? That's a great question. This dude, this diagram does appear to have two arrows. I would say it's probably not super reversible. It does seem to release CO2. Uh, and typically when we release a gas in a reaction, it's an irreversible reaction. So I feel like they're kind of, I feel like they're kind of lying to us here. Also, there's, there's not really a, there's not a case, at least that I'm familiar with, where we would want to go in the opposite direction anyway. Yeah. So I would say irreversible. And then step seven of glycolysis was not one of the irreversible. Remember, it was one, three, and 10, which were irreversible. So this is not a reversible Sorry, this is not an irreversible step of glycolysis. This one is actually reversible. But we're still going to talk about it because this step requires ATP hydrolysis to occur. So if we remember from last week, we had phosphoglycerate kinase. And in the forward reaction of glycolysis, we were going from 1,3-BPG producing ATP. So the enzyme name was for the reverse reaction in glycolysis which was a little confusing at first, but we caught on to this whole trend of like biochemists naming enzymes for the reverse reaction of how we learn them in glycolysis or citric acid cycle. In this case, since we're now in gluconeogenesis, this enzyme is named for the forward reaction because we're now going from left to right in gluconeogenesis. We're going from 3-phosphoglycerate, 
kinasing it, giving it an extra phosphate, becoming 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. So now the name of the enzyme makes sense. And the reason why we highlight this is because this step includes the fifth and sixth APP equivalents consumed during gluconeogenesis. So gluconeogenesis requires six ATP equivalents, which are four ATP and two GTP, to happen. And so these are number five and six ATPs. Questions on this one? I eat. Okay, so we've gone up the ladder. We are now at fructose 1,6-bisphosphate the forward reaction of which was catalyzed by what enzyme? What enzyme catalyzes the third step of glycolysis? Goes from fructose 6-phosphate to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. What enzyme name is that? Phosphofructokinase, nice with the one, yes, PFK1. Phosphofructokinase, excellent. So that is one of the irreversible steps of glycolysis where we are making that forward step in glycolysis spontaneous by coupling it with ATP hydrolysis, which makes this, this reverse step extremely endergonic, definitely a positive delta G should we try <laughs> to put the phosphate back onto the ATP. So we circumnavigate this problem by using fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase, where we're not actually trying to reverse the coupling part of step three. We're not trying to put the phosphate back onto ATP. We're just removing the phosphate and discarding it. So we're not regenerating ATP in this step, even though we used ATP in the forward step. And that's actually what allows us what allows this step to be favorable is because since we're just removing a phosphate and we're not trying to do two things at once and also phosphorylate ADP to ATP, it's a lot easier to do this way than if we were trying to also phosphorylate ADP to ATP. We have a phosphatase, which is a hydrolase that uses water hydrolysis to cleave phosphate from its substrate. So we're cleaving a phosphate off of fructose 1,6-bisphosphate and going back to fructose 6-phosphate. And like I said, just now, while the phosphofructokinase step of glycolysis is exergonic due to ATP hydrolysis, we're still having this step be favorable because the removal of phosphate does not phosphorylate ADP to ATP. That's all I have for this one. Any questions? And this is still happening in the cytosol. Okay, and then the last irreversible step of glycolysis that will also use a separate enzyme is glucose 6-phosphatase. So likewise, uh, phosphatase is a hydrolase, uses water hydrolysis to cleave phosphate from its substrate. And similar to step three, our hexokinase, which hydrolyzed ATP um, in order to catalyze the forward step, we're, we're getting around that problem of having to phosphorylate ADP to ATP by just simply removing the phosphate and discarding it. And this step actually takes place in the lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum in the liver, as opposed to the cytosol. We know step one of glycolysis occurs in the cytosol, but step one in the reverse direction for gluconeogenesis takes place in the endoplasmic reticulum lumen. So we have two different compartments where we're doing the forward versus the reverse reaction. Why? Why is that? Why, do we, why don't we just do this all in the cytosol like we do the first step of glycolysis? What, what problems could arise if we try to do this in the same compartment as glycolysis? How could that be problematic? Well, once we made glucose from glucose 6-phosphate, if, we if these were both happening in the same compartment, what could happen? Once we made glucose in gluconeogenesis, 
we could just immediately do hexokinase and then put it back to glucose 6-phosphate, which would consume one ATP. And then we could go back and try to do glucose 6-phosphatase and making our glucose. It's like, um, I don't know, it's like, why are you hitting yourself maybe? Or like, uh, it's called a feudal cycle. Anybody remember hearing this term, futile cycle, feudal cycle? A feudal cycle is when you're trying to do both the forward and the reverse reaction in the same place. And it's futile because it's just cycling. We would just be cycling back between glucose 6-phosphate and glucose. And that would be bad because the glycolysis step actually requires ATP. So we'd be losing one ATP to make glucose 6-phosphate, you know, go back to glucose. We lose another ATP. Does that make sense as to why it's like a futile cycle? And there's another good reason as to why this occurs in the ER lumen. Our goal in gluconeogenesis, right, is to make glucose, typically using the liver, but also maybe the kidney, sending glucose to the rest of the body. And what's beneficial maybe about doing this inside the endoplasmic reticulum with regards to then shipping the glucose to the rest of the body? Well, the endoplasmic reticulum can connect to what other organelle? The Golgi apparatus, yes, the Golgi. And the Golgi can then package things into small, uh, small little compartments called what? Golgi can package things in the small little compartments called there's the B. We're talking about secretory pathway, vesicles, right? So the Golgi can then put the glucose into vesicles, and the vesicles can then fuse with the plasma membrane and release the glucose into the bloodstream. And then we can ship the glucose to the rest of the body, especially to the muscles. So there's another sort of benef benefit to not only are we eliminating the possibility of having a futile cycle go on. We're also enabling our liver cell to then ship the glucose out of the cell before hexokinase gets a chance to do things to it. Okay, any questions here? All right, so here is our gluconeogenesis overview. We talked about the irreversible steps, step one, step three, and step 10. Reversing step 10 requires four ATP equivalents or two per pyruvate. And then step seven, phos uh, phosphoglycerate kinase, is it, is it seven, eight, nine, ten? step seven required one uh, ATP equivalent per pho three phosphoglycerates. So here are our last two ATP equivalents. So keep that in mind, the six uh, ATP equivalents needed for gluconeogenesis, because when we get to the Cori cycle in a moment, uh, we're going to see the liver use those six ATP equivalents. All right, onwards to fermentation and the Cori cycle. So fermentation in humans is the conversion of pyruvate to lactate. Are there other types of fermentation that we might be familiar with that other organisms do? Uh, do bacteria also have fermentation? Do you say ethanol fermentation? Yeah. Yeah, bacteria as well as yeast, right? Yeah, so that's um, some of our favorite, some of our favorite type of fermentation is ethanol fermentation. It's what allows us to make things like beer, wine, and, uh, and other alcohols. Yeah, so other organisms will do fermentation to ethanol. We don't, unfortunately, <laughs> we, don't, we don't do fermentation to ethanol ourselves, but for us, fermentation means to lactate. So the main uh, purpose of fermentation for MCAT purposes is to recycle NAD+. And we'll get to why that becomes advantageous in a moment. The Cori cycle occurs between the muscles and the liver, particularly during exercise. In the Cori cycle, which is related to this fermentation, muscle cells are breaking down glucose anaerobically to lactate and sending the lactate over to the liver, who then performs gluconeogenesis on the lactate, sends glucose back to the muscle cells. So the muscles can then continue to do anaerobic glycolysis. So that's gonna be our Cori cycle. Any questions before we kick it off now with fermentation? 
All right. So here's a here's a here's a good uh, here's a good fermentation uh, diagram here. Here's a good fermentation diagram. We can see our glyco glycolysis going on. So you have glucose, glucose six phosphate, glyceraldehyde three phosphate. Remember, glyceraldehyde three phosphate has a dehydrogenase, which reduces NAD plus into NADH. Under aerobic conditions, we would then send NADH to the what? To the electron transport chain. However, what, why can't we run the electron transport chain under anaerobic conditions? No oxygen, right? And we know that in the electron transport chain, the terminal electron acceptor is oxygen. So under conditions where we have no oxygen, if we were to try to run the electron transport chain, we would get stuck at complex four, whose job it is to give those electrons to oxygen to form water, get stuck at complex four, our whole ETC would be backed up and we wouldn't really be able to get very much ATP out of it. So the cell is like, yeah, 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 no, nah, we're, we're not even gonna bother with that. We don't want just weird electron buildup happening in the electron transport chain. So instead, we're gonna shut the whole thing down. Mitochondria, you're done. And we're just gonna do glycolysis over and over and over again, because we, can, we can't get the 32 ATP from complete oxidation of a glucose molecule via oxidative phosphorylation. We can't get those 32 ATP if our mitochondria is shut down due to no oxygen. We can get two ATP net from glycolysis. And that'll have to do if we have no oxygen. So what are anaerobic conditions? So anaerobic exercise would be brief, intense exercise, such as weightlifting, uh, a sprint, a 100 meter sprint. And in these conditions, the body can't deliver oxygen as quickly to the mu as the muscles needed for aerobic respiration. One way that the muscles uh, one way that muscles deal with this problem is they have a separate oxygen binding protein that's exclusive to muscles called what? So hemoglobin, which is in the red blood cells, but muscles have their own called myoglobin. And myoglobin's job is to hold on, like hold on to oxygen until the muscles need it for, for under conditions where the blood can't get oxygen to the muscle fast enough. But this is, a, this is a limited supply of oxygen. So we're gonna run out of that eventually too. And we're still gonna have this problem of we need to keep pumping our muscles, contracting our, contracting our sarcomeres using ATP, but we don't have enough oxygen getting supplied. So the way that the cell, uh, the way that the cell deals with this is via fermentation. So what we know is that we can get two ATP from glucose, uh, from glycolysis. However, the problem is we're still making NADH, which is pointless. It's not useful to us because we, like we just said, we can't send it over to the electron transport chain. The mitochondria is shut down. So what's the problem here? We need to keep doing glycolysis and we need this NAD plus coenzyme to get reduced, even though it's pointless. Yeah, like there's no point. <laughs> except for the fact that the enzyme needs to send those electrons from oxidizing glyceraldehyde phosphate. The enzyme needs a place to send those electrons to, so it needs NAD plus as a coenzyme. So in order to keep doing this, we need NAD plus. In order to keep doing anaerobic glycolysis, we need NAD plus. But the cell has a finite amount of NAD plus, a finite cellular supply of NAD plus. So that's the purpose. That's one of the two. Was one of there's a few different purposes. That's one of the purposes of fermentation, is that, and I, that's why I love this diagram so much. Because the cell's solution here is to recycle NAD using lactate dehydrogenase. So lactate dehydrogenase is it oxidizing or reducing pyruvate? Is oxidizing. If we look at the carbonyl here, it goes to an alcohol. So that would be actually reduction. Yeah, reduction. Mm -hmm. However, we know NADH is the reduced form of NAD. So NADH is becoming 
oxidized. And so when we do glycolysis, we're reducing NAD plus to NADH. When we do fermentation, we're oxidizing NADH back to NAD plus. So I, that's why I love this diagram so much because it's really showing this recycling of NAD, which is one of the main purposes of lactate dehydrogenase is it allows us to recycle NAD. Let's see, anything else I wanted to talk about here? Any questions? So that, um, there's a question, which I don't know if uh, people might think of this question, but I thought of this question, which is why don't we just send pyruvate? If we wanna do gluconeogenesis in the liver during the Cori cycle, why don't we just send pyruvate to the liver? Because pyruvate can, we can do uh, gluconeogenesis on pyruvate as we saw. And the reason is, is if we just sent pyruvate through the bloodstream back over to the liver for the liver to do gluconeogenesis on it, we wouldn't be recycling our NAD plus. So that's why it's advantageous to first convert it to lactate. So our cell can then continue to do glycolysis as opposed to if we were to send pyruvate back to the liver, we would run out of NAD plus eventually. Anything else, any questions on the slide here? All right, let's talk a little more about this lactate dehydrogenase. So here's, the, um, here's a partial mechanism of what's going on here. We said that pyruvate gets reduced into lactate at the ketone carbon, which becomes a secondary alcohol. And NADH gets oxidized to NAD plus. So NADH is getting oxidized, it's losing its electrons, it's sending its electrons in the form of this green hydrogen, which is a hydride. We're sending this green hydride over to the carbonyl, reducing the carbonyl. So here's our hydride. So hydride, remember, it's hydrogen plus two electrons. We're sending these hydrogen two electrons, reducing pyruvate to lactate. And then here's, you remember like seeing like NADH plus, NA plus H plus was like in all of the uh, reactions that reduced NAD plus to NADH. Well, here's sort of the H plus that's now getting consumed so that we can oxidize the carbon to oxygen bond by adding hydrogens to both of them. That's why I kind of like this. Now we'll, we'll look at the sort of like larger structures of like FAD and NADH when we cover the electron transport chain because uh, that, that's, that's the thing that the MCAT could ask you. They could ask you about the larger structure. So in this case, we're just looking at sort of the relevant parts of the structure here. Um, and likewise, for a lot of our other, this is one of our themes is that sometimes scientists name, <laughs> name enzymes for the reverse reaction of how it usually gets done. This is another case where lactate dehydrogenase would actually describe the reverse of this direction, uh, re the reverse of this reaction where we're oxidizing lactate, reducing NAD plus to NADH would be the opposite. And uh, in one of our themes was when we oxidize a carbon to oxygen bond, NAD plus gets reduced to NADH or NADH gets produced. And so likewise, when we reduce a carbon to oxygen bond, we oxidize NADH to NAD plus. And like we said, NAD plus allowed uh, glycolysis to continue. So one thing that I, I learned, which was really cool when I was doing my research for this lecture was that the uh, lactate is not just for the Cori cycle. It's not just for us to do gluconeogenesis. Actually, a lot of cells will use lactate dehydrogenase when their citric acid cycle is, is saturated, when their enzyme in the citric acid cycle have, have so much acetyl-CoA that they, the whole thing becomes sort of backed up or, or it's working in maximum capacity and we can't send more molecules down to the citric acid cycle. So lactate can also, I thought this is really cool, can serve as a temporary storage of pyruvate and then wait until the citric acid cycle is processed a few more molecules. Okay, now we can oxidize you back to pyruvate and then we can send pyruvate now into the mitochondria. Uh, and I think it's like, it's like about like 75% or something like that of pyruvate will actually become lactate and just cell kind of just like holds onto the lactate until citric acid cycle is not busy. It's like, uh, you're busy right now. We'll come back to you later. We'll send you. We'll send you pyruvate later. We're just going to hold it as lactate again because that would allow us to continue to run glycolysis because we would still have NAD plus, um, and we wouldn't have pyruvate sort of feedback inhibit pyruvate kinase from glycolysis. Yeah, <laughs> uh, like yeah, I love I love nerding out and like learning about these things. I think it was cool too. Okay, so um, how do we then get the lactate out of the out of the cell? So our job, our, our purpose now, we want to send the lactate to the rest of the body. So lactate is shuttled out of the cell via monocarboxylate transporters. These are called MCTs. Um, monocarboxylate, it's a, has a molecule with one carboxylic acid. And it's uh, what type of transport is this where we're sending 
you could look at it here as well. Here's our lactate and here's our H plus. They enter into the transporter and then transporter opens on the other side. What kind of transport is that? Active, would it be primary active or secondary active? Well, primary active would be have the ATP hydrolysis, right? Because this would be like, would this be like symport, antiport? It'd be like they're going the same direction, so we could call it symport. Yeah, symport. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, um, one of our one of our esteemed colleagues here sent me a DM uh, from Wikipedia. It looks like during fasting, hepatic glycogen stores become depleted. And gluconeog so hepatic glycogen stores become depleted during fasting. And then gluconeogenesis accounts for a progressively greater proportion of renal glucose release. In humans fasted for 60 hours, the kidney accounts for over one third of all glucose released into circulation. Okay, interesting, yeah. Um, so the kidney, the kidney is doing about one third of the work of gluconeogenesis uh, compared to the liver. He said uh, secondary active transport. So secondary active transport is when we use a gradient. So the gradient is the proton gradient here. Often it'll be a sodium gradient. Here is a proton gradient. We're using this proton gradient to pump lactate out via secondary active transport. Mm -hmm. um, one other thing I encountered, anybody like weightlift or talk to weightlifters who will talk about, yeah, like you get that lactic acid burn when I'm like working out, like when I do a huge set or something like that. The lactic acid causes the burn when you're working out. Apparently that's a myth. Apparently it's not true. I guess they debunked that uh, because lactate's not protonated at physiological pH. So it can't be responsible for like a lactic acid burn. It's actually the protons from glycolysis. The protons from glycolysis, as we oxidize glucose, we lose, we also are gonna lose some protons. So when the muscle's doing tons and tons of glycolysis, it's also pumping a lot of protons out, and that's what causes that feeling of burning sensation. It's the acid built, uh, the acid produced by glycolysis. Um, and actually, lactate, lactate, kind of like bicarbonate, can serve as a buffer for H plus in the blood. So once lactate is in the blood, it can absorb a little bit of H plus and help to sort of negate some of these effects of the burning sensation. Um, and uh, as you rest, you know, it, it'll, the lactic acid burn goes away in like 15, 30 seconds because of what, uh, what system in the blood? That'd be our, that's our buffer system in the blood normally. Bicarb, yeah, bicarbonate buffer system. So lactate's actually gonna help out the bicarbonate buffer system while it's being transported over the liver for gluconeogenesis. However, uh, lactate acidosis can be observed in metabolic disease. So it is definitely, it's definitely a problem. There's a, there's a long list of different metabolic processes that will, um, that will lead to, or metabolic deficits that will lead to lactate acidosis. But it's not the, and it does take, take away, this is, just, this is just fun fact, this is a trivia, but lactic acid is not responsible for the burn. All right, so we've talked about um, lactic acid fermentation. We've talked about what's going on in the liver. So here's our diagram of the Cori cycle. This is my favorite Cori cycle diagram. So skeletal muscle we talked about is under limited oxygen conditions. So it's gonna be working on its glucose producing pyruvate and then lactate recycling the NADH so that it can continue to do glycolysis. And then lactate is gonna be, in here you have different compartments. We have the blood compartment. Lactate is transported through the blood to the liver. For the liver, it's gonna perform gluconeogenesis. So this is one of the main roles of gluconeogenesis is when we're in the liver, making glucose to send back to actively working skeletal muscles. Another main role of gluconeogenesis, as we'll talk about in the future, is during, during fasting conditions, during starvation. We've already kind of elaborated or uh, alluded to that. And we talked about the ATP equivalence. So this is why we we're talking about ATP equivalence of gluconeogenesis. So we can connect that the liver is actually expending six ATP to get glucose back to the skeletal muscle. 
So the, the liver is fine. The liver is not lacking in energy. The liver is not the one who's contracting those sarcomeres and using tons and tons and tons of ATP. The liver is fine. It's got a lot of ways to, get, to generate energy. It's a very uh, resourceful organ. And so it doesn't matter to the liver that it's making this sort of sacrifice. The liver is sacrificing a few ATP for the greater good of the body so that the skeletal muscle can continue to run anaerobic glycolysis. Questions before we move on to glycogen stuff? Time for glycogen stuff. So uh, two reverse processes involving glycogen. We have glycogenesis and glycogenolysis. Um, people sometimes have trouble remembering which one's which, but we're gonna solve that real quick because genesis is origins when we produce glycogen. And lysis we know is breakdown. So breaking down glycogen, we glycogenolysis and building it up would be glycogenesis. Glycogen is the major storage of body of glucose in the body. What a hormone would glycogenesis be promoted by? Insulin. Excellent, insulin, right? When we have too high of blood glucose, we need a place to put it. We could excrete it in the kidney, uh, but that's not great because that's we could use that later. Instead, we can store it as glycogen, both in the liver and in the muscle, as we'll see in a little bit. So glycogenesis is promoted by insulin, so we can store our glucose, hold on to it for a later time when we need it. Uh, glycogenolysis is promoted by which hormones? Glucagon. Glucagon. And? Kind of the same ones as? Gluconeogenesis. The glucagon wants to raise blood glucose when glucose is too low. What are other hormones that would want to increase blood glucose? Two others. Epi, epinephrine, as well as what was the third one from before? It's the stress hormone. Cortisol. Cortisol. Good. Yeah. And glycogen's, glycogen's great because you can really rapidly mobilize glucose from it. Gluconeogenesis probably takes a little more work. Glycogenolysis will actually kick in. We'll talk about the stages of like which processes are, are present in exercise and starvation. Uh, but glycogen is a great way to rapidly mobilize glucose. We have to do very few things to get glucose from glycogen. So rapid mobilization. So especially during exercise. So here's, uh, here's a big picture of glycogen structure. So we can see, uh, we can see all these little tiny molecules. These are all little glucoses. And we can see the glucose uh, sort of like the ring and then the hydroxyl groups of the glucose are the oxygens are red and then little white hydrogens. So here's all of our glycogen. We have some linear change chains. We have some branch points. So branch point, branch point, branch point. And what does the structure in the middle here represent? Is that also a sugar or is that something else? What are these little loop-de-loops? Yeah, this is a protein. Little loop-de-loops are what? Structure. Beta sheets, I think. See, beta, beta sheets are, are gonna be, beta sheets are these little guys here. Like this is a beta sheet, this is a beta sheet, but the loop-de-loops are similar to DNA, which has a helix. Yeah, so alpha helix. Alpha? Yeah, so we have some alpha helices, the loop-de-loops, and we have some beta sheets that are like, beta sheets are represented as like a, like sort of a flat looking like arrow. The central protein here is actually an enzyme named glycogenin. So glycogen, we know a lot of proteins have the suffix in, like insulin. Um, and so this is a protein, it's an enzyme called glycogenin. And what is the role of this dude? So it's not just to be a central protein, it's actually an enzyme that synthesizes the first few glucose subunits in glycogen. So glycogenin synthesizes the first few glucose subunits, after which 
the major glycogenous, glycogenic pro, uh, enzyme glycogen synthase will take over. So we have, a, we have an initial protein, an initial enzyme, which synthesizes the first few subunits, after which the major one takes over and does the rest. But uh, glycogenin is really analogous to what enzyme in DNA replication? DNA polymerase, I think. So uh, glycogen synthase would be the polymerase. What we know about DNA replication is you can't do de novo DNA replication. Like you can't start from scratch. There needs to be a what before you can do it? I think a primer. Primer. And so this is performed by primase in DNA replication. You have the primase makes the first few nucleotides out of RNA, right? Polymerase takes over and does the rest. And then you have what is gonna take it out? Actually, it's a different polymerase that, that excises and, you have, and then fills in the gap and then ligase seals it all up. Yeah. So um, glycogenin is analogous to primase from DNA replication. This, this slide, I don't think it's super important for the MCAT that you know about glycogenin. You're definitely gonna hear about it in med school. Uh, so for our purposes now, this slide is just for fun. And to get, kind of give us a sense of like, how do things kick off before we head into some of the, the meatier details? Glycogen structure, two types of linkages in glycogen. You can see them on the slide. We know that the linear chain of glycogen is made out of what connections? between glucose molecules. So if the linear being alpha 1, 4, good, alpha 1, 4, and our branch points are alpha 1, 6. You can see sort of, we can, again, like here's our glycogenin, and then you can see some of our linear chains and some of our branch points. So glycogen synthase is the one who's gonna do the linear chains and then glycogen branching enzyme, bran branching, branching enzyme, branching, glycogen branching enzyme, which makes the branch points. Um, why does glycogen have branches? Why don't we just have just a linear glycogen chain? One benefit is that the branching, if we were to have just one linear chain, we then wanted to break down glycogen into glucose subunits, how many enzymes could work on that linear chain at once? It would just be one, I think. It would just be one. And that's not really beneficial if we wanna rapidly mobilize glucose. So this solves the problem of like, how do we set up the structure so we can get the most glucose out of it the fastest possible? Well. We give it all these branch points. We could have one. We have one enzyme breaking down here. One enzyme breaking down here. One enzyme breaking down here. So we can have many enzymes breaking glycogen down, giving us glucose all at once. And our branch points instead are alpha one six. Questions on this slide? All right. Moving on to. Uh, we have this nice Jack Weston diagram uh, looking at the steps of glycogenesis and glycogenolysis. This is really all you need to know about these two processes. Step one of glycogenesis. So we're building up. We're going from glucose, glucose 6-phosphate, glucose 1-phosphate, EDP glucose, and then glycogen. So step one is glucokinase. <clears throat> this is one of the problems with this Jack Weston diagram is they called it hexokinase. Hexokinase is a glycolytic enzyme. Glucokinase is a glycogenic enzyme. Glucokinase is an isozyme of hexokinase expressed predominantly in the liver. So what would an isozyme be? Looks like the, yeah, what would an isozyme? Would that be an enzyme isomer? It doesn't make sense. But. That's a good guess, yeah, because iso, like iso we know is like isomer or isoform or in this case, isozyme. Yeah, so yeah, exactly. It's, the, it's an enzyme that catalyzes the same reaction, exactly. Mm -hmm. 
So a isozyme is an enzyme with a different primary sequence that catalyzes the same reaction. So isosame, zyme, enzyme. Whereas isoform is when we take a different combination of exons and we do what to them? Isoform is when we take a different combination of exons and do what? Splicing, right? So alternative splicing is when we have the same gene and we take different exons, combine them uh, to make a isoform of the protein. Yeah. So yeah, um, and yes, yeah, so this diagram is incorrect. It's actually glucokinase. Now, so glucokinase actually has a higher KM than hexokinase. Does that mean that glucokinase has more or less affinity for glucose? less affinity. And so why would it be beneficial for hexokinase to have a high affinity for glucose? Because beneficial for hexokinase to have a high affinity for glucose. Can it, it, down? Mm -hmm. it can, yes, yeah, it can do a job. It and also reduce the, the, this, what do you call that now? The, that a transition state for it to break it down so it can bring it down a bit closer. Uh, so it's not so much about the activation energy. They they both gonna break they're both gonna bring activation energy down. Because but then so talking about affinity, so if you have a high affinity, then you can operate as an enzyme even when substrate concentration is low. Low. Oh. Yeah. So that's beneficial for hexokinase because we know hexokinase, we want it to operate even when there's, even when we're running out of glucose, we don't want hexokinase to not be able to operate. So it makes sense to have a low KM, high affinity. Whereas glucokinase, we want it to do its job when there's low or high glucose. And when it's low. Well, right, when, well, when, we, when we're making glycogen, we're usually making glycogen because there is a deficiency or an abundance of glucose. Abundance of glucose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when we have too much glucose, exactly. So glucokinase, therefore, can be active only when there's a high amount of glucose. In other words, when we want to store glucose. Whereas their hexokinase can operate even in low glucose concentrations. So if we had low glucose concentrations, we probably are actually, we're probably using a lot of glucose and we want to continue to. That makes sense? Another, fa uh, another feature of glucokinase that's different from hexokinase, hexokinase is inhibited by glucose 6-phosphate. It's feedback inhibited. Glucokinase is not feedback inhibited by glucose 6-phosphate. So when glucokinase catalyzes the reaction, converts glucose to glucose 6-phosphate, it's not going to be inhibited by the product it just made. Why would that be beneficial for an enzyme involved in making glycogen? Because is, is glycogenesis, is production of glycogen driven by us having an abundance of, glu of glucose? more so, or a deficiency of glycogen, more so. Abundance of glucose. Yeah, yeah. So just because we have a lot of glycogen doesn't mean we don't want to make more because we're, this is our rainy day fund. We're saving up glucose as, we want to save up as much as we can possibly store so that we, when we have a rainy day, when we're starving or exercising, we can use it as much as, we can have as much as possible to use. So in other words, glucokinase is driven by glucose supply, not driven by demand for end products. Whereas with catabolic processes where we're breaking molecules down for metabolism, typically that's driven by the need for like ATP, for instance. So it kind of makes sense as to why it shouldn't be feedback inhibited by glucose 6-phosphate because 
we're not, we don't want to stop just because we made some glucose 6-phosphate. We only want to stop when we have lowered our, our amount of glucose. We have no longer have abundance. Another, and, and by the way, these, are, these aren't things to memorize about glucokinase. These are, these are fun facts that'll help connect to other topics like enzyme kinetics, like feedback inhibition. So we can, we can exercise our other knowledge of metabolism or other, like, other topics in, in biochemistry and uh, organic chemistry and biology. Because another purpose of glucokinase is in pancreatic alpha and beta cells, it acts as a glucose sensor. Why might it be beneficial for pancreatic alpha and beta cells to have a sensor for glucose levels? Because then they know when to do what? So they know when to release insulin or when to release glucagon. There you go. Yeah. So also, a, a I mean, a very cool use of like an enzyme. It's like, yeah, like they know it makes they know when to release insulin versus glucagon. I thought that was I thought that was also really cool. Sorry, I just have a question on this. Um, can you confirm the fact that this uh, glucokinase is an isoenzyme of pixokinase? I'm a little confused about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So isoenzymes are two enzymes with a different sequence, but catalyze the same reaction. I believe the where glucokinase originated is that there was like, I think there was like a, a gene duplication. So you probably duplicated the gene for hexokinase. And then over evolution, hexokinase mostly stayed the same, but glucokinase probably evolved to be doing a similar but different job, a similar job that operates under different conditions. So they evolved to have different amino acid primary sequences, but do the same thing, but also have sort of different nuances where like hexokinase, we wanna run it when even when we have a little, only a little bit of glucose. Glucokinase, we wanna run it when we have a lot of glucose. So that's that's sort of the the 101 on like isos Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. My pleasure. Step two of glycogenesis is going to be phosphoglucomutase. So phosphoglucomutase, we talked about mutases last week, are transferases that catalyze uh, the tr uh, transferases that move a functional group from one position to another position. So they're sorry, not transferases, isomerases. So mutases are a subcategory of isomerases. So we're going to have the same structure. So here's where we have isomers. We have glucose 6-phosphate as an isomer of glucose 1-phosphate. Why, uh, why would this enzyme want to put a phosphate on the 1' prime carbon of glucose in preparation for making glycogen? What is that one prime glucose gonna one prime end of glucose gonna do later? It's gonna be involved in a where are the linkages again? There are one, four, one, six. This one prime end of glucose is going to be involved in glycosidic linkages. Yeah, so in this case, we don't want to do phosphoglucose isomerase, which would actually turn it into fructose 6-phosphate. We want to link glucoses via 1 to 4 and, and also 1 to 6 glycosidic linkages. So what's beneficial and what I think is kind of cool about having glucose 1-phosphate is when we have our glycogen synthase put everything together, there's going to be another step too, but when we have our glycogen synthase, add this glucose to the growing chain of glycogen, the glucose is coming in. Remember, high, phosphates are high energy bonds. Glucose is coming in with its own energetic. It's like, uh, it's like bring your own, it's BYOB, uh, bring your own energy for the party. You're bringing your phosphate, which carries the energy needed to add you to the chain. So you're you're helping out glycogen synthase. Glycogen synthase doesn't have to also do like ATP hydrolysis to catalyze adding glucose to the glycogen chain. Does that make sense? So it's kind of like in DNA and RNA synthesis, where in DNA and RNA synthesis, we're, we're not just like adding a adenosine, adding a guanine. Our substrates for glucose, for um, our substrates for DNA and RNA synthesis are DNTPs or deoxy, uh, deoxy 
ribonucleotide triphosphates or NTPs, ribonucleotide triphosphates. So the, this, the, the monomers in DNA and RNA synthesis carry their own energy that gets hydrolyzed in pyrophosphate. And then we add, uh, we add nucleotide monophosphate, phosphodiester, nucleotide monophosphate, phosphodiester. So similarly, these glucose 1-phosphate molecules are going to bring their own uh, energy source so that glycogen synthase doesn't have to also be responsible for ATP hydrolysis. So that makes sense. In other words, they're storing chemical potential energy in these bonds. All right, onwards. Now we have UDP glucose pyrophosphorylase. Now, don't be intimidated. This isn't complicated as much as it looks. So what, we're, what we said previously is that glucose 1-phosphate has the phosphate. So it has energy needed to polymerize glucose. So we're just adding, in this step, we're actually just adding more energy to the glucose. So this is an enzyme that adds a, this is actually uris, uridine triphosphate. This is a nucleotide triphosphate. We, could, we referred earlier to like GTP as an ATP equivalent. So likewise, UTP is an ATP equivalent. So this is like ATP hydrolysis in this step with one sort of twist, which is that we're actually adding the, the uridine nucleotide, nu, uh, nucleoside itself to the glucose. Uh, releasing pyrophosphate. So again, we're just setting up additional high energy phosphate bonds. So the glycogen synthase in the next step doesn't need to hydrolyze ATP. Uh, what class of enzyme is a pyrophosphorylase? Would that be a um, isomerase, transferase, oxidoreductase, ligase, lyase, or hydrolase? I think it's a transferase. It is, yes, it's a transferase. Perfect. And here's sort of uh, what's going on from reactants to products in this step. So we're starting with our glucose 1-phosphate. And the phosphate is acting as a nucleophile to break off a diphosphate, also known as pyrophosphate. And so we're adding uracil ribose and 1-phosphate to glucose 1-phosphate, which is why we end up with UDP glucose. That's what's actually going on in this step here. And again, purpose, just to give us extra high energy phosphate bonds that we can cleave uh, so that we can use that energy to fuel glycogen synthesis. And uh, so the first step of AT, uh, first ATP used in glycogenesis was glucokinase. And this is the second they call ATP equivalent used in glycogenesis. And now the big players here. So we are finally making our glycogen. We've set up all these steps in order to make this step really easy to do for glycogen synthase because of the busy enzyme, it's got a lot to do. So we use energy in this step from UDP to form glycogen bonds, to form glycosidic linkages. You can see here's our insulin, which is uh, stimulating this process. Now, the, the mechanism for this has not been established. Um, there's speculation about whether it's a hydrolase, a lyase, so not going to be important as to the class of enzyme here. But kind of like we were saying earlier, like the body doesn't care what kind of enzyme this is as long as it gets the job done. Glycogen synthase is going to have two isozymes. Uh, we talked about isozymes uh, with glucokinase and hexokinase, and glycogen synthase will also have two isozymes in the liver and in the muscle. One thing that I found interesting while I was doing research for this presentation was that muscle glycogen synthase is upregulated during hypoxia adaptation. Why would that make sense? During hypoxia adaptation. What's a hypoxia? Hypoxia. So hypo, is that too much or too little? It's too little. Too little. Hyper is too much. Hypo is too little. Oxia sounds like what molecule? Oxygen. Oxygen. So when we're hypoxic, we don't have enough oxygen. So would it make sense that if we're under hypoxic conditions, we would want to store more glycogen in the muscle? Yeah, makes sense. <laughs> makes sense, right? Because then we can hydrolyze more glycogen into glucose, 
So this could be, you, you ever hear of like altitude doping when like runners will like go work out in like the Rocky Mountains or something like that. So that they, one of the benefits is that your body has to produce more hemoglobin. You have to do more hematopoiesis, make more red blood cells. So when you go back down to sea level, you have more red blood cells than runners who did an altitude dope. This could be another version of altitude doping where you are, you're forcing your muscles to store more glycogen. So that maybe when you fly down to Los Angeles for the big run, uh, you, you, you have an advantage over your competitors. You got more glycogen in your muscles. Uh, so that, I thought that was fairly interesting. And like we said with glycogen. Oh, sorry. I just have a side question. Mm -hmm. Um, cause I don't know if you heard, but did you hear about the Olympic athlete, um, the ice skater? I think she was like banned from, um, competing in the Ol Olympics because of like a steroid that like caused too much like oxygen. Would this be related to that case or? It, it's similar, but different, right? Because in that case, you're at, like, it's like, what's, what's fair in competition? Lance Armstrong has a heart that's like, like 50% larger than the average heart. Michael Phelps has like, like. The body of a fish essentially it's like what's fair when it comes to competition is it fair for you to take some exogenous steroid um, injected into your body so your body can work harder than other athletes who are not taking the steroid perhaps not mm -hmm. is it fair for you to, if you have the resources to have your olympic team get sent up to the rocky mountains and train there so they can get more hemoglobin and more glycogen in their body nat via natural me methods and then go back down and like have that competitive advantage still it's like yeah, yeah. I, I didn't, yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't sure how, I heard about that a little bit, but. Yeah, because I was thinking how, like, I, I know that it's, like, of course, like, I was wrong, don't get me wrong. It's just, like, you know, she had, like, more, like, oxygen than, like, the average, I think she was an ice skater, so it yeah. kind of reminded me of that, like, but just because she was just inject, like, ingesting it or injecting it, so it can, it, like, it was, like, because it has, like, more, um, like, blood got pumped up a lot more quicker or something like that than because of, the, like, red blood cells, like, got spread out, oxygen got more delivered. Would this be similar to like the glycogen synthesis with like the high, um, like the opposite of the hypoxia adaption or not the opposite, but like, it's like, yeah, it's more, I would say it's more analogous to like the, when you go up to the altitude and your body does more hematopoiesis. So you have more red blood cells, more hemoglobin for oxygen storage. I would say that's more analogous, at least on the physiological level to that. Okay, thank you. But, it, but in the sense of like giving you a competitive advantage, it is analogous to that. Mm -hmm. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to read about that because I, now I want to know what the drug is and how it works. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've, actually, that, I've actually experienced that on a high altitude. Oh, yeah. And, and there were actually people that couldn't just breathe. They had to just sit, right, um, while others were still okay. And strangely, when everybody came down, everybody was fine. So obviously yeah. that's what was going on. Yeah, yeah. And different, different people adapt to altitude differently. Um, yeah. Um, and you, yeah, the reason why you're producing more hemoglobin, of course, is because there's less oxygen up there. So your body has to compensate. Yeah. Cool. Glycogen branching enzymes. So we talked about how do we make the one four linear chains. Uh, we also want to make these branches. As we talked about, this helps us with uh, having just multiple regions for hydrolysis of the, uh, of, the, of the glycogen later. So glycogen branching enzyme is going to be, it's, it's actually, it's interesting that while this, this is the growing chain, so this is where, this is where glycogen synthase is adding these glucose subunits, the glycogen branching enzyme is going to come up to the work that this glycogen synthase did. It's going to pick up a whole bunch of glucose units and place them somewhere else, um, just creating more branches. And then now these can, all these can now be growing chains. We can grow here too, and maybe we can put another branch here later say transferase, it's a hexosyl transferase. Um, and then, yeah, similar to, similar to, this is kind of similar to protein folding in the sense of like, ha, like remember like thermodynamics of protein folding when you have just the linear, um, like primary amino acid sequence, you're forcing more water around it. And the water doesn't like that because the water is forced into an ordered position. So then when we fold the protein back up, into this nice, neat sort of like maybe globular shape, then we're actually allowing more water molecules to flow freely because there's fewer water molecules needed once to, to surround this thing once it's folded. So that's called the hydrophobic effect from protein thermodynamics. 
So somewhat approaching folding, um, branching increases glycogen volume relative to surface area. And this leads to less waters are being forced to order around it. Um, and this is gonna actually increase solubility because there's less waters forced around it. And it's going to also decrease cellular osmotic pressure because we don't need as much water to come into the cell to help stabilize, to help order around the, around the glycogen. Um, and as we said, it's also gonna make glycogenolysis easier since glycogen has multiple ends or multiple enzymes instead of one just linear chain. Any questions on glycogen branching enzyme? All right. And now let's talk a little bit about glycogen synthase regulation. Oh, here's our mascot. <laughs> just woke up from his nap. We have glycogen synthase regulation here. So uh, we have two different versions of glycogen synthase. We have active and inactive glycogen synthase. And when glycogen synthase gets phosphorylated, it becomes inactive. So if we walk through this process a little bit, we said epinephrine and glucagon are gonna lead to producing glucose from glycogen. So breaking glycogen down into glucose is done by epinephrine and glycogen, or is, is they stimulated by. And it looks like they're working through an adenylate cyclase cyclic AMP protein kinase A pathway. So what is, um, oh uh, yeah, because we don't want to, we want to deactivate glycogen synthase when we have epinephrine and glucagon. We don't want to store glucose at glycogen. We want to, we want to hydrolyze glycogen into glucose. So what type of receptor are these guys working through based on adenylate cyclase cyclic AMP protein kinase A? What type of receptor? No idea, Charles. <laughs> so um, when you see when you see adenylate cyclase, cyclic AMP protein kinase A, you want to you want your brain to immediately go, ah, oh, that's a G protein coupled receptor. I know that. Yeah. So these are this is always sort of the G protein coupled receptor pathway. Yeah. Um, and when we when you talk about G protein coupled receptor pathway, we always hear about this protein kinase A doing something downstream. And in your MCAT prep books, a lot of them will stop with protein kinase A and they won't really elaborate what happens afterwards because it actually depends a whole lot based on the type of cell, what happens afterwards. In this case, this protein kinase A is phosphorylating glycogen synthase that's active into inactive phosphorylated glycogen synthase so that we're not storing glycogen, glucose as glycogen, and then our other enzyme that breaks down glycogen can then break it down without having glycogen synthase also synthesize it more. Because again, that would be a feudal cycle. If we're hydrolyzing glucose um, from glycogen, but we're also storing glucose as glycogen, we're just wasting energy at that point. And then uh, it would make sense as well as to why insulin is stimulating the opposite. Because we know that these enzymes, these, these hormones, hi buddy, this is Sun, everybody. If you haven't met him, Sun, say hi. Say hi to the camera. Yeah. That's... Oh. <laughs> Cut that one. You like actually said hi. <laughs> My heart. Um, hey, y'all, I'm going to pause the recording real quick. OK. So now we have um, insulin is doing the opposite of epinephrine and glucagon. We said insulin causes us to store glucose as glycogen to lower blood glucose. So this is just, this is regulation. I'm not sure that you, well, I know that you don't need to know <laughs> that these guys act on glycogenesis, glycogenolysis via this process. You don't need to know that, but it should kind of, it should kind of make sense. And it's just a good, it's a, the purpose of me putting this in this uh, PowerPoint was just so we could see an example of a G-protein health receptor, to be honest. All right, so our last process of the day is gonna be glycogenolysis. First step in glycogenolysis, we're now at glycogen and we're going to begin by using glycogen phosphorylase. So when we stored glucose as glycogen, we went through glucose 1-phosphate, UDP glucose. We use the high energy bonds there to catalyze or to, to couple formation of glucose as glycogen. So we're gonna do the opposite now. We're gonna use phosphate to actually break down the glycosidic linkages. 
So glycogen phosphorylase release is an enzyme that uses phosphate to break off a molecule of, G, of glucose one phosphate. And what type of enzyme would glycogen phosphorylase be? Phosphorylases are. Type of, it's not a, not a lyase. It's a good guess because it is breaking something down. It's actually going to be transferases. So phosphorylases are going to be transferases. And as we can see here, stimulated by epinephrine and glucagon. So while epinephrine and glucagon tended to uh, disable the glycogen synthase, they're going to stimulate the glycogen phosphorylase. And that should make sense because we both want to, both of these want to increase blood glucose. Uh, cortisol also is, gonna, is going to stimulate glycogen phosphorylase, so that's an indirect mechanism. So I wasn't able to include it here. Here's what's actually going on. Now, the mechanism is a little complicated for our purposes here. Uh, it actually involves, so we are breaking down a glycosidic linkage via addition of phosphate. So here's our terminal glucose that we want to cleave off. And here's our rest of our, here's our N. This is the rest of our glycogen. So the way that it works, and this is why I didn't really include it, because it's a weird ass, weird, weird ass reaction here. The anomeric carbon of this terminal glucose right here will attack the phosphate carried by glycogen phosphorylase. And then glycogen, the rest of the glycogen will act as a leaving group. So we had a glycogen branching enzyme. Turns out we also have a glycogen debranching enzyme. So after, after glycogen phosphorylase has cut down, has cleaved down some of these glucose uh, subunits, so you have know, these glucose sub one phosphates, boom, 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 boom. So after we've cleaved off some of that glucose one phosphate, we're then going to start removing the branches that we made previously. And so glycogen B branching enzyme is going to pick up, I love how they color coded this, it's going to pick up these guys and then move it over here, where then glycogen phosphorylase is going to be able to break down further subunits of glucose one phosphate. And then this diagram also includes the glucose ph phosphoglucomutase, gonna turn it back into glucose six phosphate and then back to glucose. We'll, we'll have those on the next slide as well. Glycogen D branching as that moves the remaining branch to a linear chain. So it's moving the, the, the remaining branches off to a linear chain. So the, the inverse of what glycogen branching enzyme did in glycogenesis. And a little more just about uh, regulation of these two different processes. So we have muscle glycogen and we have liver glycogen. And the regulation of glycogen synthase is similar in both. So we talked about previously hormones that regulate these enzymes. They'll also be regulated allosterically by some metabolic molecules. We can see glucose 6-phosphate, glucose 6-phosphate, ATP glucose. So both uh, glycogen synthases will be stimulated by having glucose 6-phosphate. That would make sense because if we have glucose 6-phosphate, we want to shuttle that down, make it into glycogen, so we can then use that later. Why would it make sense that like ATP would inhibit glycogen phosphorylase? Because if we have ATP, what? We have abundant ATP, do we need to hydrolyze more glucose? We probably don't, right? Yeah, if we have an abundant ATP, we don't need to make more glucose. Um, so that would make sense. Same with glucose 6-phosphate, same with glucose. We have a lot of glucose. We don't want to be uh, hydrolyzing glycogen down to glucose. These should make a fair amount of sense. Uh, glycogenesis is supply driven. In muscle, this is interesting, calcium actually stimulates glycogen phosphorylase. Why would that be? Why would, this is specific to muscle, liver doesn't have this. Um, so why would, why would calcium want to stimulate glycogen phosphorylase? Because what is, what is calcium indicated in the muscle? What does calcium presence in the muscle indicate? 
we know that um, calcium's job in contraction, yeah, the cross bridge cycle contraction. You know, calcium's job is to bind troponin and then troponin calcium complex will move tropomyosin off of the, act, of the uh, myosin binding sites of actin. So myosin can then go and then we can do sarcomere things. We can shorten our sarcomeres, yeah. So it should make sense that we would want to have, <coughs> excuse me, we should make, it should make sense that if we want to have more, um, if we're actively contracting and we have calcium, we probably want more glucose so we can continue to contract and we can continue to do glycolysis to, in, order, in order to make ATP for contraction. Whereas it should also make sense as to the fact that glucose is an inhibitor of glycogen phosphorylase in the liver, because if we have abundant glucose, we don't want to break down glycogen. It should also make sense as to why glucose is not an inhibitor of glycogenolysis in muscle. Because if we're doing glycogenolysis in muscle, we'll probably still have some glucose, but we want to use that glucose and we want more. We want to use the remaining glucose and we want more. We don't want to inhibit glycogenolysis just because we have some glucose, because we want as much glucose as possible so we can continue anaerobic glycolysis. Does that make sense? And then this, is, this diagram is missing the phosphoglucomutase that happens in muscle. So muscle will do phosphoglucomutase, but then the glucose 6-phosphate will then become fructose 6-phosphate, and it'll continue through glycolysis. But it, it should make sense that in muscle, we're not going to do the reverse step of glucose 6-phosphatase to make glucose, because the purpose of glycogen in muscle is not to make glucose, it's to once we have glucose 6-phosphate, just do glycolysis on it. We wouldn't want to do glucose 6-phosphatase in muscle because that would actually, we'd have to just go back to glucose 6-phosphate during glycolysis. Does that make sense? Whereas in the liver, we want to make glucose so we can send it over to the muscle. All right, and then we're not going to go through this diagram. This is just kind of for your own, your own um, edification. Move this. Yeah, perfect. So this is this is just for fun, uh, but we're we're not going to go through all of the steps here. We can see some of the regulation we looked at previously. Now that was good enough for regulation for me, but we can also see that uh, glycogen phosphorylase is going to be subject to regulation as well. Oh my God, what's going on with this scarf? The scarf is moving. Okay, um, so that is all we're gonna to cover today with regards to carbohydrate metabolism. And let me fast forward to our take home slides. All right. So next week, we're gonna be covering pentose phosphate pathway electron transport chain, lipolysis, beta oxidation, and if we get to it, fatty acid synthesis. And no, we're, forget about that. We're not gonna get to more than that. And so here's our take home mean. Are any last questions for the recording for YouTube? <laughs>